An estimated half a million Australians have intelligence files, which essentially means all the intimate details of their lives are recorded by ASIO surveillance teams. ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, has been operating in this country for over 60 years. And now for the first time, top secret ASIO files will be on public display at an exhibition opening tomorrow at the Justice and Police Museum in Sydney. Greg Miskelly has a preview. They are the file notes of Cold War era Sydney, long hidden from view. Balzac said there are two kinds of history. There's the history you read in school books and on the front of newspapers, which is all lies. There's another kind of history, a secret history, much more scandalous, and it's the one that tells you how things really happen. At the Police and Justice Museum, a covert world of photos, phone taps and even spy gadgets is being prepared for public view. Curator Hayden Keenan has researched the ASIO files of some prominent Australians for over five years. You start going into what I would have to describe as a, a, a dark biography. Um, uh, your file will feature you on every page and as you read through the file we gradually get to know all there is to know about you from the point of view of an intelligence agency. We get to meet all your family, your friends, your lovers, your wife, your workmates. If they're really on to you, all your phone conversations will be um, synopsied and, and praised. Um, all your travel, all the flights you're on, the rooms you stayed in. I think at the height of the Cold War, ASIO had between 150 and 200 paid agents who were paid to penetrate organisations. They had more than a thousand, several thousand contacts. They had the power to tap phones and open mail. They had a, a file registry of at least 100,000 files. Chifley set up ASIO in 1949, but he was voted out fairly soon after that. The exhibition explores the rise and expansion of ASIO during the Cold War, when Russian spies were infiltrating Canberra. And I have no doubt myself that the communist tactics are to disperse forces and to divide. In Menzies' era Australia, the fear of communism was rife, and Australian members of the party, like Frank Hardy, were targeted. I find that the law of conflict, the basis of Marxism, is a very useful world outlook for me as a writer and I feel integrated as an Australian, as a writer and a communist. Despite being a celebrated novelist and playwright, Hardy was stalked by secret agents for most of his life. Frank's got 15 thick volumes up to between 1949 and 1980. Um, there's almost nothing in his file that indicates that he's a, a threat to the state, um, prone to violence, uh, he's a major dissenter um, and what you see is, is ASIO involving itself in some ways in the arts more because of Frank Hardy. We are pleased to see some people come here. We are very pleased. What a wonderful friend they are. In the 1960s, Frank Hardy was instrumental in social causes like the land rights movement. He supported and publicised the famous Wave Hill Station walk-off. Soon ASIO were keeping files on Aboriginal activists. Historian David McKnight says ASIO was influenced by the conservative governments of its day and misunderstood the politics of the protest movement. When the anti-Vietnam and anti-apartheid movements emerged and the new left emerged, ASIO saw them as a threat, as a big threat. The government certainly saw them as a big threat. Uh, and it's true, there were communists involved in those movements. But of course, the mentality of the time meant that if communists were involved, they were assumed to be in control or secretly in control. And the only job then was to try and find out how they secretly controlled these movements. ASIO ended up on this, this hunt for uh, Communist Party members, what was called front organisations, and this took in everything from World Council of Churches, peace movements, um, mother's clubs in primary schools. Well, it is a threat to the state and it probably is Michael Kirby's. Hayden Keenan says the files are windows into the young lives of now very respected Australians. Along with the exhibition, he's now producing a forthcoming SBS series 
called Persons of Interest. One of those is Roger Millis, a teacher, writer and actor, and the son of an active communist leader. He was under surveillance since childhood and later experienced huge impacts when ASIO information was secretly utilised by government agencies. They were very tense and turbulent times and just to be mentioned before the Royal Commission on Espionage put the fear of God up some people. In September, two years ago, when two time bombs exploded in the Sydney offices of a Yugoslav tourist agency, a new wave of controversy started about ASIO's activities. By the 1970s, a Croatian nationalist terror attack and a series of intelligence leaks led to criticism of ASIO that it had become too ideological. Extensive damage was done in this explosion. I think Gough Whitlam and the whole of the Labor Party, when they came to office in 72, were deeply skeptical about ASIO because quite rightly, they saw it as a tool of the Conservative government. And that is, now that we've got the files open, we can say that definitively. There are many, many examples. It's expected Mr Whitlam will announce next week the name of the judge who will head an inquiry into all our intelligence services. In 1975, the Hope Royal Commission triggered greater scrutiny into the secret agency's far-reaching powers. In a sense, what all that they did was to say, well, you have to rationally justify your targets. Uh, ultimately, you, it was a modern management culture was introduced with performance reviews and all those other terrible things. Um, and so, yes, the Hope Commission had a very big influence uh, on the functioning of ASIO. In 2011, it's the war on terror that preoccupies ASIO. In 2009, ASIO intelligence led to the conviction of 17 Islamist terrorists in Sydney and Melbourne. But an intense focus on monitoring Islamic community groups is for some a real cause for concern. Sheikh was astonished <laughs> by wondering what on earth he was supposed to have done, so he went about trying to find out what he'd allegedly done that could have had him assessed as a security risk and uh, he, he hit brick walls everywhere. He, he was completely unable to find out what he had supposedly done. He went to the High Court in the end to get permission simply to know what he'd been accused of. Uh, and he was told that because he was a foreigner, he wasn't allowed to have access to that material. Father David Smith is a supporter of Sheikh Mansour Legay, who fought a long battle against deportation after an adverse ASIO ruling in 1995. He says ASIO has had real impacts on the Sheikh's family and community. I think we've all got questions of ASIO. I mean, I know the man like a brother, uh, and I, I know he's being honest when he's saying he has no idea what he is supposed to have done wrong. Uh, and we believe it's, it has to go back to some uh, stuff up. But of course you can't find that out. The whole process is such that it's all covered up. I think if you're dealing with genuine threats to security, then a significant degree of secrecy is necessary. It's, it's really unavoidable. But what happened in the 60s was a, a political threat, not a genuine threat to security. Today it's different. One of the things that I'm hoping from this exhibition and later from our series is that we can draw out some historical threads into the contemporary age for people to be able to say, well, how should we oversee an organisation like this.